Amen. You may be seated. Now, I have to offer an apology to my wife ahead of time for this story. Uh, but but it'll, hopefully you'll see how it fits into the overall message. It was, anyway, the evening of uh, Friday, January 7th, 2000. Uh, and actually, coincidentally, uh, Rhonda brought in uh, pictures from 1997 in the months where I first met Bernadette. And, uh, and then by October, we, we uh, uh, started dating and the rest is history. But this was Friday, January 7th, 2000, and we were picking up Bernadette's wedding dress in a shop on Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey. How many of you have been in Wayne, New Jersey on Route 23? It's a lovely place to be, isn't it? Um, and following that, uh, I, I began to drive. I was actually driving. Um, Bernadette gets motion sickness, so she drives the majority of the time. So, like, this is one of those rare instances. I was behind the wheel. It was exciting. Uh, and, and we were heading toward Bloomingdale United Methodist Church, uh, which is the church we got married in. And we were going there for our wedding rehearsal. And then it happened. The car began to stutter, and then it stalled right in the middle of Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey. And if you've ever been there, you know that is not the place you want your car to stutter and stall. Now thankfully, I was able to coast the car over to the side of the road, and once safely on the side of the road, I began to see red. Have you ever had that experience where you start to see red and you know you're getting angrier and angrier and that's all you can see? That was me on the side of the road. Uh, not one of my most graceful moments, we'll just say. But I was so mad that this had happened. You see, earlier in the day, Bernadette had been driving and I, I saw that the tank was getting kind of low and I suggest we get gas and I, she said, oh yeah, we will, don't worry, we'll get it at some point. And we kept going and then later on I saw that the, the gas got to check gauges and I suggested, you know, because I'm like one of those people that if you're at like a quarter of a tank, like you need to fill gas now, my anxiety level just goes up until we get gas. So I'm like, you know, we're on check gauges, we should get gas. Oh yeah, yeah, not a problem. You would be surprised how far you can go on check gauges, like at least 20 miles. <laughs> Which is true, you can go pretty far on check gauges. But as it were, we were going from place to place that day trying to get ready for the evening and then we both forgot we were on check gauges until I started driving in that moment on Route 23 in Wayne and the car stalled. And after multiple attempts of trying to get, trying to get her to get gas, um, I just blew a gasket. I was so mad because we could have avoided this. This is something we could have avoided if we had just stopped and gotten gas. Thankfully, my best man, Kevin, knew me well enough to say, hey, Bernadette, why don't we go walk to the gas station, get gas, and come back? And they left me there, <laughs> which is a smart move. And uh, I just stewed in it the whole time. And finally, like by the time they got back, I was cooled off. Um, but he knew that would give me enough time to cool off. Uh, but it put a damper in the night, to say the least, as you can imagine. Of course, we all look back now, and it's funny when Kevin and I get together and we talk about like the, the silly things of the past. This is one of the stories that comes up, and we look back now and we laugh over it. It's funny now, but it wasn't so funny then. But looking back, it really was so silly that I got that mad over something so trivial, you know? And what it came out of was the panic and the fear that we were going to be late, and that we could have avoided this. And I let the fear and the panic get the better of me in that moment. Friends, running out of gas and or breaking down happens in our life of faith as well. Have you ever been in a place in your spiritual journey where you felt like you were running on empty? Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt 
like you should be praying more, getting more involved in small groups and missions, yet you just don't have the energy to do it, or you appear to have it all together, everybody looks at you and they think, oh, that person's got it all together. But your soul is on empty. When you should be putting more spiritual fuel in your tank, but you forget or neglect to do so. How many of you have been there? Let's be honest. I've been there. In our scripture reading today, we find the disciples in the upper room on Pentecost. And it is an amazing scene, right? The wind rushes in, there's tongues of fire dancing on the heads, and they're speaking in all of these different languages, and it is a wow moment in the Bible, right? But leading up to it, it wasn't such a wow moment. Prior to that moment, they were hiding. They were in hiding and fearing that their lives would be lost. Remember, Jesus had been crucified by the Romans as a traitor. Now, if you are crucified as a traitor by the government, that puts your family and your friends at risk too, doesn't it? Because if he's a traitor, they're traitors too for being a part of his cause, right? So they were hiding and afraid for their lives. But before Jesus left them, after he resurrected and he was walking the countryside, teaching people and gathering his disciples together, before he left them, he had set their path for them, and he had given them a world-changing mission. But can you imagine the conversations they had walking down the mountain where Christ descended from? Looking to get back to reality. Returning to their day-to-day -day lives with the feeling of being completely empty and wondering how to manage all they were commanded to do by Jesus. And I'm sure they would have much rather gone out into the world and given it a shot and cut their losses if, they, if it didn't work, but just to go and do and get their minds off of everything. But Jesus said, no, stop, wait, pause. Stop in Jerusalem and wait there. Which, by the way, Jerusalem's like ground zero for them, right? This is, where, this is where the authorities are looking for them. And Jesus is just saying, hang out in Jerusalem. I'll send you the Spirit someday. It'll be great. So there they are. They're waiting. The, the apostles needed a way to move forward. And it would have been easier for them to go out and work, to begin to do the ministry of Christ uh, that, that Christ called them to do to see if it worked and cut their losses if it didn't. But Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem. And then a week later, a sweeping wind and tongues of fire, God poured out the Holy Spirit on these empty followers of Jesus. The filling of the Holy Spirit mobilized the apostles to go out into the world and filled them with the necessities to make the journey. They had the power through the Holy Spirit. And, in fact, they were, they were so filled with the Spirit, so beside themselves with, with the presence of God, that people thought they were drunk. They said, look at these drunken fools dancing around and speaking in crazy languages. Who are these guys? Peter had to dismiss them. We're not drunk. It's only 9.30 in the morning. Now, that never stopped any iron worker. But still, these people were thinking that they were drunk, and they said, we're not drunk. This is the Spirit of God that has filled us. Peter dismissed the, the, those who were claiming that, and he proclaimed that this new power was from God. Now that stop in the journey, that delay which led to, the, to their waiting in the upper room, ended up filling them for the mission Jesus had planned for them. Amen? That is, that is a brilliant and beautiful thing. Friends, what I hope you learn today is this. In order for a road trip to be a joy ride, remember Jesus, others, yourself, right? In order for the road trip to become a joy ride, you need to realize that the journey matters as much and sometimes more than the destination, amen? That's the reality. 
that we oftentimes, we're so focused on the end game, we're so focused on getting to the end that we forget the important uh, processes in between. We forget that we are supposed to be soaking in and living the journey as much as hoping for the destination. I love going on long road trips uh, because I love to see the different places along the way. I love to experience the, the journey along the way. And sometimes we, we get in a plane, we hop there in two hours, and we've, over, like, we've gone over like a ton of land that we never even saw, and we miss all of that because we're in a rush to get to where we're going. Every joyride, my friend, should include a can't-miss stop along the route where we can regroup, where we can take in the scenery, where we can soak in the setting, and we can refuel. It's important in your faith journey not to miss the movement of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if we rush, 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 do, 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 we're going to miss what the Holy Spirit can and will do through us. So my question for you is this. How will you open yourself up to God's Spirit? How will you open yourself up to God's Spirit? When I was mad on the side of the road that day, it's because I wasn't going to get there on time. It was about me. It was about my ability to get us there on time, and we didn't get gas, if we'd only gotten gas, we would be there. But you know what? I needed that moment on the side of the road. I needed that moment, and God said, you know what, Todd? You can wait. How will you open yourself up to God's Spirit? There's always a temptation to do things in your own strength, but when you do, my friends, you will run out of gas, amen? We don't have the strength to do what God's going to do. We're not God. If we try to do things on our own power, we will run out of gas and be set back with frustration and hopelessness like I was on the night of my wedding rehearsal. And it's one, almost 20 years later, we're still together, by the way. You see, that running out of gas thing really wasn't all that important, was it? And I'm lucky we're still together after that night, to be honest with you. But when we try to do God's work, relying on our own strength, we are like glasses poured out empty. When we tap into the power of the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, we are not empty. We are filled with the flow of God's power. The Spirit gives us a fresh vision for God's ministry. It gives us the desire and the motivation to do it, and the assurance that God will get us there, even if we don't know exactly when or how. The, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit is not just given to a few, but is given to an entire community, amen? Are we the community of God? Can I get an amen on that? It's not just to a few, it's to the entire community. So how will our church use what the Spirit is offering to us? And the Spirit is offering it to us. How will our church use what the Spirit is offering to us? How will we become a church that through the Holy Spirit is more reflective of the community of Newton around us? Take a look around. Have you, we've all been out in the community, right? We know, we know Newton pretty well, right? Are we reflective of the community around us? We could be better at being more reflective of the community around us. Treasures of Hope is reflective of the community around us. We could, we could do better in that. How will we become a church that is more reflective of the community of Newton around us? How will we grow in diversity, in missional outreach, in hospitality, and in our presence in our community? When I think of Holy Spirit and power, I think of young Logan, who will be up here in a little while. I think of young Logan, whose parents are about to become members today. 
He is so filled with the Holy Spirit that he makes his family sit and listen to him as he teaches them about Jesus. Amen? When I see Logan, you know who I see? Hi, Logan. When I see Logan, you know who I see? I see me. Because when I was his age, I did the same thing. I would take, now this is dating myself, but I would take the tower of eight tracks that my mom had, and eight track tape tower, and I would use that as a pulpit and teach my parents that God tells us to love one another. Three, three years old. So when I see little Logan, I see me. And who knows where God is going to take that. And you're all a part of that journey. Hopefully. When I see, when I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of young Logan, who also tells his family that you need to take communion, and he serves some communion with whatever he has around, even if it's acorns and apple juice. <laughs> he loves God, and he knows he is loved by God. The Spirit has touched him and is working within him, and it is not only transforming him, but his entire family is being touched by that. Little Logan has the power and the desire to grow God's kingdom. And brothers and sisters, we can too. We can too. All we need to do is be willing to pause, to stop steering our own car, and allow the Holy Spirit to feed, fuel, and steer us. I hear Carrie Underwood already, Jesus, take the wheel. All we need to do is surrender to God and allow God to do the rest. But we have to be willing partners in it. We can kick our feet up and point fingers and say it's that person's fault or this person's fault or that reason or this reason that the church is dying. But the truth is, friends, we are the church. And if we're not willing to be the church, we've only got ourselves to blame. God doesn't do the blame game. The devil does. All we need to do is be willing to let Jesus take the wheel of our lives, and to be committed to what Christ is calling us to do in the context of our community. We need to be willing to let God fuel us. And like gas, the Holy Spirit, my friends, is worth stopping for. Because when we're fueled and God begins to drive us, there's nothing that will get in the way of our ministry. Amen? There's nothing that will get in the way of our ministry. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we love and thank and praise you, and we know that we are loved by you. Lord, you are calling us to be your people. You are calling us to do your work, and you are asking for us to trust in you. Don't let our fears, Lord, don't let our fears and our anxieties get in the way of what you are doing in and through us. Help us to be active partners in what you are doing so that we together may share the load and do the work that you have called us to. So that mountains may be moved and fields may be leveled so that the kingdom of God may be rooted here in Newton and beyond. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ.